Uh, I must say I'm very pleased, I'm, I'm very happy to be here and uh, give a talk about uh, Palambala, which um, I have given uh, 15 years of my life so far. Now, as you heard in the introduction, Palambala Colindros is a site. Um, we have been excavating with Paul Halstead since the turn of this century, uh, since 2000 that is. It is a site located on the west side of the Thermaic Gulf, now less than five kilometers inland and less than 50 from Thessaloniki, right at the entrance of the narrow valley that leads to the west towards Veria and next to the river Aliakmon. The site has an early, middle, late, and final Neolithic component, occasionally used as a burial ground during the late Bronze Age and more intensively in the middle Byzantine period. Among our initial aims were to study the formation uh, um, processes of the site, Palambala having evolved during its long Neolithic life into a low tell. At the time the excavation started, 15 years ago, settlement types seemed a particularly meaningful aspect of the Neolithic way of life. Anthropologists, geographers, architects, and urban planners have repeatedly maintained that space is a significant dimension of human social activity. The inscribed human action turns space from a simple container into a place broadcasting meaning. Space and its organization are thus closely associated with the way people perceive and manage the sets of their formal relations among themselves, that is, with what we concisely call the social structure. So understanding site formation processes was in many ways tantamount to understanding social processes. What we have not perceived, however, was the great antiquity of the site. Although based on surface finds, we thought initially that the site dates towards the end of the early Neolithic, we were surprised to find out later uh, that according to carbon-14 dates, Palambela lies within the earliest Neolithic sites of, in Greece. Apart from indicating how sufficiently we know the initial phases of the period and its related material culture, this turn of evidence offers a unique opportunity to study in detail a pioneering settlement of farmers in the north of Greece. The question of the earliest Neolithic in Greece is an integral part of the discussion about the Neolithization of Europe, which has never gone totally out of fashion, despite the decades of heated debate that are already behind it. Part of the reason for its recent flashy comeback are the developments in DNA analysis, which appear to have returned the whole argument back to its biological aspects, with some vengeance, I might add. There is, of course, an almost obligatory consensus now that the Near East had the leading role, at least chronologically, a consensus which has put to an end what, as Guillen has said, to the indigenous period of neolithization. However, to some extent, we are back to precisely what the indigenous argument tried to refute um, in the last analysis, namely the predominantly biological portrayal of the problem. The dominant role of domestication of the 1970s was hiding a certain biologism. Now there is a risk to introduce biologism in the imposing presence of the biomarkers of human agents and the active involvement in the solution of central archaeological problems of bioscience. Personally, personally I prefer to view the neolithization process as a cultural and social event, if not more, at least as much as a biological one. The thing is that the, in the particular case of the Greek Neolithization, much of the discussion rests on generalized co covering models of Near Eastern provenance and origins. Except for Frankthi and possibly Knossos, the earliest Neolithic is barely known in its details in Greece. Information as a rule comes from small excavated areas, usually below later deposits, that do not permit the uncovering of larger, more meaningful contexts. The case of the Thessalian sites comes readily to mind, and of course, Knossos. We'll see why Palambela offers a better opportunity in this respect, and that people of, at the early settlement control and allocated space in a surprisingly tidy and organized way, which we can easily identify. As already said, the manipulation of space is connected to social rules and restrictions, 
and serves as a proxy for social organization and structure. From this point of view, social reality of this early community becomes accessible to a significant degree and it can add to the discussion of the neolithization process and often neglected bottom-up dimension. Let us now turn to the excavation and present the recent finds excavated this summer of 2016. The early Neolithic part of the settlement was investigated in 2006, 2009, and 2012 in an area of approximately 150 square meters. 2016, we, in 2016, we investigated only a part of that area, which had not already reached bedrock in the previous seasons. The whole area of the site reaches around 30,000 square, 30, square meters, but we were lucky because the different phases are not located on the same spot as they would do in a proper tell site. As a result, the early Neolithic deposits are free of superposition of later phases and readily accessible. The deepest deposits on the site rest on the parent rock of a yellowish marl which sits in a variable depth below the surface. The presence of the rock is a secure mark of the end of the deposit, so once we reach the rock, we are confident that previous periods do not exist in that particular area. Such is the case for the middle and the late Neolithic deposits. The type of the settlement combines futures of tells in the sense that one may observe the superposition of consecutive phases of building activity within one period, and features of flat sites where building activity is relocated within the broader limits of the site, as you can see in this slide. I cannot be sure whether Palambela has been a maverick site all along its life in comparison to standard Thessalian tells or central Macedonian flat sites, but the discussion of typological classification is not the topic of this talk, and I will not deal further with it tonight. Some degree of discontinuity, however, between periods seems very likely. The settlement of early Neolithic was dominated by the presence of pits of moderate dimension between 2 and 2.5 meters long. They were shallow and cut directly into the bedrock, as you can see here. And... Um, in some cases, the bedrock was left standing to form a small wall, like here or here. Few were circular, and uh, had uh, smaller dimensions, but on average, they were of oval shape. In the area investigated, nine pits were excavated so far, except pit 2008 -1, which preserve a simple hearth. All the others were kept clean with no traces of any domestic activity. Later on, we will see why. We discovered very few objects in the pits, which were occasionally completely devoid of any pottery, a, sh a sure sign that preparing and eating food did not take place in them. We did find at least two some systematically. We did find, however, few items of personal decoration. We interpreted these pits as dwellings. Already by 2012, we have verified that the area of the early Neolithic was the result of an extensive and systematic landscaping. Landscaping the area of the settlement is an uncommon practice, not documented so far in any other of the early Neolithic sites in Greece. The landscaping was done as follows. The first settlers of Palambela cleared away the soil down to the rock. Then, before cutting any pit dwellings, they carved the rock into stepped horizontal terraces. We have identified at least two terraces, a lower one and an upper one, standing on average 60 centimeters or more from each other. After making these terraces, they dug the pits on the... Uh, you see here the, uh, the difference. This is, the photograph is taken from the level of the uh, pits, and this is the upper terrace up here. So after making these terraces, they dug the pits on the exposed surface of the rock. 
Stratigraphic evidence documents the succession of episodes. The soil horizon above the bedrock had been completely removed on both terraces as the cutting of the pits was done directly into the bedrock, not through any soil horizon. The removal of soil was not a universal practice, however. In 2012 season, um, the two th 2012 season identified at least one area where the original paleosol remained intact. You can see it here, and uh, it's this area here, this area, this whole area here. Um, something which was verified and better understood by the 2016 excavation and with micromorphological analysis, analysis carried out in the meantime. And uh, you can see, um, I apologize for these very uh, not so informative pictures, but I just um, didn't have any better and uh, to persuade you that we did micromorphological analysis. Manipulating so persistently the natural features of the dwelled area, clearing the natural rock and forming step terraces is indeed an uncommon practice that exceeds functional requirements of pit dwelling construction. As such, it must have projected powerful messages of permanence, emplacement, and order. Such a communal labor at the earliest beginning of the Neolithic way of life in Greece would act as an ideological equivalent and a metaphor for the wild for the white land, transformed by human labor into a field of wheat. In a way, it is a form of domestication of the landscape. Now, before going into that, I just wanted to give some, some uh, um, explanation here. This, what you see here, this is a ditch of the Middle Neolithic, so you have to take this out. It's a ditch, a later ditch that cuts through the pits, but the pits are here. You see pictures afterward, afterwards showing that. Landscaping the living area represents a significant find of the 2012 season that sets our understanding of the early Neolithic settlement into a different path from the model of Frank the Ethnosos, even of Sesclo, Argisa, and Achillion. The systematic management of space in Palambela forces us to abandon our simplistic ideas of makeshift dwellings, of primitive architecture, underdating the introduction of proper rectilinear houses, and regular settlement plans, uh, or the ideas of temporality of early settlement. This sophisticated arrangement, taken as a whole, turns these simple pits into a planned and carefully executed design of the living space, a real place for the community. So 2012 was in many respects a very successful season. However, the best was yet to come in 2016 season. Based on indications available in, in the upper terrace, I was able to suggest already in 2012 that this area was wholly devoted to activities related to food processing and preparation. You see here remains of uh, meals, and uh, traces of uh, food preparation and uh, little pits. Firstly, the significantly smaller size of the pits precluded habitation. Secondly, the remains of mills and abandoned charcoal found in the pits, as you can see in the pictures, pointed to food processing activities. Keep in mind that pit dwellings were found clean with no traces of fire, save some little pottery, occasionally none at all, and rarely some objects of personal ornament. If the above assumption were correct, we would have a sharp separation of functions within the settlement underlying architecturally. Habitation in the larger pits cluster on the lower, here, terrace, and food processing and consumption on the upper terrace, standing above the habitation area. So far as I know, this is the first early Neolithic settlement where the community takes all this pain to express the separation of daily functions so explicitly. Why would they assume then all this effort to do that? Some interesting deductions stem from the points raised here. Let us return to pit dwellings. They were found clean with only an occasional personal ornament, as said before, ear studs or beads, and objects such as bone tools or one intact bone fish 
Cook. You can see it here. The size of the pits points to one, maximum two persons living in these dwellings. Micromorphological analysis of their deposits corroborates the macro observations that the inside of the pits was kept clean. And you see here one of the earliest pits, the stratigraphy of one of the earliest pits with the different layers, some of which, some of, the, some of them are later than uh, the beginning of the Neolithic. Samples from pits 630, this is the one, carbon-14 dated to around 6600 BCE, indicate anthropogenic deposits with low abundance of organic inclusions, interpreted as a result of non-intensive anthropogenic input. A, dis a distinct episode follows shortly, interpreted either as abandonment and collapse of the walls of the pit, or as an intentional construction of a new floor for the pit dwelling. Eventually, pit 6, 6, 60, 30, 630 is abandoned, and three successive microstrata strata of gradual infilling fill up the pit before the end of the early Neolithic. That's the top part. And you can see here, if you look more carefully, the area where the samples were taken. You see these two blocks. Um, these deposits of the abandonment are rich in ashes, construction, and other materials of diverse origin, indicating discard from the still active upper terrace. The low intensity of human activity seems compatible with the relatively small size of the pits and the solitary habitation. Similarly, it is also consistent with limited activities, such as sleeping and sheltering, probably eating cooked food, judging from the presence of a few very fragmented um, animal bones, but no cooking or manufacturing of objects. And these are the uh, bones that have been studied by Paul Halstead and, well, not only this, of course, and Valasia Isaikidu. Um, pit 2715 was excavated. Okay. So this is 2715, the area here. Pit 2715 was excavated down to to bedrock to reveal a rare construction carved into the bedrock. You can see it here. With no parallels in other Neolithic sites in Greece, it consists of three basins carved in the rock, each one with one deeper mortar-shaped recession near its edge. You see here. And uh, here it's, it's not very visible in this photo photograph, but you can see it. Here is this pit filled with uh, these uh, stones. It consists of three, ba yes. They were tentatively interpreted as threshing installations for grain. The threshing would be carried out by pounding the grain with wooden pestles in, much in the mortar-shaped uh, hole, as we see in many ethnographic examples. And you see here ethnographic examples from different parts of the world where this is for dehusking the grain. And here from the Fermi site, in, uh, <coughs> near Thessaloniki, you can see a similar hole here that has been interpreted like that, but this is late Neolithic. Six more similar installations were located on the upper terrace, so the overall um, number of threshing installations amounts to eight. Three comparable examples exist at Palambela in the Middle Neolithic. Um, they indicate the persistence of the practice, but they are made differently using a portable stone mortar surrounded with a clay rim. We'll see later, later on why it is important that they were installed inside three different houses. Two of them were found in this last season. To my knowledge, this is the first time that similar material evidence becomes available for the earliest Neolithic. We are waiting, of course, for the macro, botanical, and phytolith analysis, both in progress, to give additional support. One thing is certain, however, so many food processing installations 
in such a small area indicate beyond any doubt that this is an area of communal work. In contrast to habitation, food preparation and consumption represents a predominantly public event. <coughs> With the finds of this year, the picture of the plan of the early settlement becomes very clear. The public area, the area where the community is collectively preparing food and in all likelihood consuming it, is set up on a higher level, overlooking the individual pit dwellings which are located around it, on a lower level. To the north, the excavation has uncovered the face of the rock, artificially sloping down, but had not reached the point yet where the bedrock flattens, forming a terrace. You can see, let me go back. Okay, so you see here, this is the north face, which has been uncovered this year, and this is the, the, the face we already know, which is about 60, 60 centimeters higher, and this is the um, conjecture uh, phase, which we haven't found because it's in the bulks. So this is the communal place. Okay. And the installations are one, two, three here, and then another one here, four, and a few more there, and here, and there. So all, overall, eight installations for uh, threshing on this communal place. <coughs> um, Okay, so excavation of this area revealed evidence for the cutting of more pit dwellings here also. So if we go back, this is the face of the, the north face of the communal place. And then um, the indications are that we have pits, cuts in the, uh, in the rock that go around this area as well. Um, so the lower terrace turns around, uh, um, possibly encircling it. So around this central place, you get these uh, habitation uh, pit dwellings. It seems that the lower terrace, um, yeah, uh, to the south, the public area is defined by a track dug into the bedrock. So if I go back, no, here. So this is the south face of the communal area, and you see this track uh, cut into the bedrock um, going uh, from uh, east to west or from west to east. The southern wall of the track stands again higher than the lower terrace with the pit dwellings. You can see it here. This is the south wall of the uh, track. Closer examination revealed that the post holes uncovered in 2012 were in fact threshing installations mistakenly interpreted in 2012. In that case, another public area is hidden here, up here, with another cluster of pit dwellings surrounding it. One of those expect expected pit dwellings had already been excavated in 2012. So this is the actual plan of the village as, or the uh, settlement as we understand it with the present evidence. So you see there are two public places or communal places if you like. One here, we don't know the extent, it's, this is arbitrary, and one here which is defined by um, this um, limit, okay? This, um, And uh, these are the uh, threshing constructions, similar to those, exactly similar to those, again, cut into the rock. So you have the same pattern, low habitation and higher public place. And here is one, we have only found one of those uh, pit dwellings, which is here, the one with the little hearth, and then we assume that others might be hiding around the public place. The existence of more than one public place at close distance to each other makes these places modules of communal production dispersed within the settlement. They stand as an objectification of social ideal of communal sharing. We cannot for the time being know for sure 
where the clusters of pit dwellings are physically organized in separate groups related to each other of the modules. This would offer a very attractive possibility for getting some idea of the smaller social groups acting within the community, as for example clans, extended families, etc. And it is a priority for next year. It is worth keeping in mind in this regard that the track physically defining and separating the two places could also be a border delimiting the different resident social groups. Now I'm referring to this track. Nevertheless, the answer to the question, why would the people of Panyambala invest all this labor to shape the settlement space into a powerful contrast between prominent places of communal public activity and individualized pit dwellings, we have to take a look at the basics of the social world. To do that, we have first to take a look at the broader picture around Pajambela. The compelling evidence from Pajambela reopens for a start the issue of pit dwellings at the beginning of the Neolithic in Greece, a possibility which scholars rather hastily, I think, had rejected. A re-examination of earlier excavations shows that the evidence was always there, but its significance has been overlooked. The picture seems now possibly reversed, or has the possibility to be reversed, and pit dwellings in early Neolithic settlements in Greece look like the general rule. Although for obvious reasons the earliest and deepest deposits of the Neolithic tells have not as yet been explored to sufficient extent, the lack of typical, typical house architecture is still spectacular, especially in comparison with the roughly coeval and related Neolithic sites of the eastern coast of the Aegean. Sites like Uluchak Huyuk, dated to the first half of the 7th century millennium BCE, have produced complex architecture with rectilinear buildings and mud brick walls, plaster floors, and traces of wall paintings. So, Chuck, Yuk, it's here. Other sites in the same region, sim similarly representing the oldest horizon of the central Aegean coast of Turkey, notably Ege Kubre and Gesilova, Huyuk, also preserve substantial architecture with rectilinear houses, I'm sorry, built with stone socles. The earliest levels of Tsukurichi Huyuk dated at 6,684 plus or minus 28 BCE, revealed complex 24, you can see it here. This is the, the building, the walls of the building defined by linear clay walls. They contain a sequence of at least two lime plastered floors with layers painted bright red and up to three successive hearths. The description indicates a sophisticated domestic building. By contrast, the earliest phases of, of the Greek sites, although they have many things in common with the Eastern Aegean sites, and participate in the trans-Aegean obsidian network, show an entirely different architectural concept. Sesclo has only pits and ditches cut in the, into the bedrock, some of them representing possible dwellings, like this one here, which is very early, uh, assigned in the A ceramic, which we don't believe anymore, but anyway, very early. At Lerna, clusters of pits were similarly uncovered on the basal layers of the later early Neolithic, but were characterized as clay pits. Further north in Greek Macedonia, uh, so it's Argisa, excuse me, and Achillion. Further north in uh, Greek Macedonia, Revenia is a site of the early Neolithic, where pit dwellings are the only existing architectures, and Mavropigi to the west, Macedonia is a new pioneer site where pit dwellings are also present in its earliest phase. You can see it, see it here with this, whatever, the purple color. So, see a, a big main pit here and smaller pits around and some ditches 
This is the early phase. And of course, in uh, Mavropigi, you have the succession, which is much, a much later phenomenon. It's about in the, in the last centuries of the uh, um, seventh millennium, where you have houses pretty much like the Nea Nicomidea site, which now has to be dated to the same period, that is, the advanced early Neolithic. Pit dwellings continue to appear all through the Neolithic, at least in Greek Macedonia, but also, though perhaps more rarely, in Thessaly. Not a single site dated to the initial phase of the early Neolithic in Greece, that is before 6400 BCE, starts with the rectangular houses. It seems as if a long tradition of architecture was, was lost while crossing the Aegean. The architectural evidence shows that rectilinear houses replaced pit dwellings only later in the early Neolithic, that is, during the last couple of centuries of the 7th millennium BCE. Many of these houses start to exhibit unmistakable traces of routines and practices related to storage, preparation of food, and consumption that become even more evident during the subsequent Middle Neolithic, that is from 6,000 to 5,400, roughly. At Palambela, this replacement takes place at the start of the Middle Neolithic, around 6,000 BCE, when the pit dwellings were already, as we saw before, abandoned and filled up, and a deep ditch, the one I pointed out, cut through them. At that period, Rectangular houses appear in organized clusters, as you can see in this, uh, in this picture. One of those houses preserved ample evidence of food preparation and cooking. That's this house here. Um, such as a large central fire installation, you can see some details here. Um, excuse me, possibly an oven, a threshing installation on the floor of the house, similar to those that were concentrated in the public area of the early Neolithic. You see a threshing installation here, which is different in uh, construction because it's a, it's, a, it's a stone mortar that has a, a clay lining on top, but I suppose it was for the same use, but it's inside the house, so it is controlled. It is protected. Um, Querns and grinders inside storage facilities and quantities of pottery for cooking, serving, and consuming food were part of the house assemblage and of many middle Neolithic house, houses. The contrast with the earliest phases of the settlement is particularly revealing. Food preparation and consumption now, rather than public and open, has become control at taking place behind closed walls in the domestic domain. Micromorphological evidence confirms that the domestic area of Middle Neolithic houses has a much more intensive and continuous use in comparison to individual pit dwellings with their brief episodes of habitation. At least three distinct rebuildings have been identified here on the top one on the top of the other, indicating a marked stability of the house. No open area for public food processing and consumption has been identified so far at Palambela. What I'm arguing here, therefore, is that this systematic shift from pit dwellings to rectilinear houses was not merely an architectural serendipity or a typological change. It declares a whole new perception of space, a different organization of daily life, founded on a deeper shift in the social domain. According to the anthropologist Peter Wilson, who has studied the effect of built environment on human society, space is used, I quote, as an elementary tool for the making of political structure, end of quote. He was the first in 1988 to point out that the permanence of location, time anchored in space, as he says, in his expression, is in reality an active material statement of ancestral lineage, stressing stability and continuity in human built environment. House, stab house stability has been directly connected to tell settlements in Central Europe and the Balkans by John Chapman, and is considered a very central factor of the longevity of Neolithic tells in Greece as well. Um, 
In opposition to temporary huts be built over pits, houses like the ones in Middle Neolithic Panyambela reinstate their stability by their physical presence and by repeatedly occupying the same spot of the socialized space of the settlement. Contrary to huts, which, as Wilson observes, have a short time span of use and are open to one another's view, houses hide their residence and activities behind walls, forming a vivid analog and the material declaration of a new, separate social group, the household. In this sense, houses are, so to speak, strong political arguments for household independence from the community as a whole. The partition of everyday activities in two distinct and marked areas observed at Palambela is a sure token of the absence of the household as a structuring pr principle of the early Neolithic. The emphasis ascribed to the collectivity of public food preparation and consumption and the contrast with the individualized, fluid, and occupied with intervals dwelling space can be perceived as going totally against the logic of the household. Households are continuous and stable, discrete entities, and they tend to restrict and canonize open and free commonality by establishing institutions such as hospitality and household-to-household -household exchange or feasting events of conspicuous consumption. Before the emergence of the household, however, the grip of communal sharing and solidarity on the early Neolithic farmers and their concepts and daily lives was so strong that they did not need ideological props, such as an ostentatious redistributive ritual to naturalize it. Small-scale shared preparation and consumption was enough to reassert it every day. In any case, it is useful to, know, to note that the presence of the house artifact was not so much the product of imitating or transferring a form from somewhere else, but primarily the outcome of social structure and its transformations. I think this deep connection with the social domain has to be considered when movement of cultural forms is rather quickly proposed. And finally, conclusions. In conclusion, let me go back to the question of the onset of the Neolithic in Greece and touch a few points related to my favorite teaching subject at the university, the Neolithization process of the periphery. I will not try for sure to define the point of origin of the Greek Neolithic or the rate and itinerary of dispersing of the new regime. The Neolithic is by its nature multicentric and arithmic, as Guillen says, so far we can tell. The priority of the Near East and Anatolia is of course now indisputable, and there are no grounds anymore for pure indigenous view. There can be no doubting of the many cultural features that are transferred one way or another from East to West together with domesticates, as of course from west to east as well. But how useful is this last platitude to account for the variability existing in the archaeological record? How closer do we think we understand the phenomenon when the most likely next of kin to the earliest Greek Neolithic sites, namely the communities of the Aegean coast of Anatolia, fail to transmit such an essential feature of the social structure? I'm referring of course to the household and its spatial expression that is the standing house and its independence and autonomy against the community. Its absence becomes even less comprehensible if we take into account that these elements form a well-established tradition in Anatolia going on for thousands of years. I have several times insisted that the monism of Neolithic models as the varieties of the Neolithic package concept are disappointingly inept to account for the surprising variability existing in the archaeological record. Agricultural and domesticates may have been transported from Anatolia, but we have not yet assessed the contribution of the Mesolithic plant gathering to the human plant relation built up in Greece. Much less, we have not recognized the variability existing within the early Neolithic Greek sites, even those belonging, belonging to the second or third east-west wave. For example, the discovery of a new type of gloom wheat in the Greek context and Palambela indicates that there were probably more zones of domestication than the ones recognized traditionally in the near, near Eastern literature as Glenis zones, uh, 
who has studied this evidence um, claims. Lastly, agriculture is first and for foremost an adaptation, and I don't only mean a natural adaptation. Preferences on particular types of wheat may equally represent cultural choices, as we have argued together with Tanya Valamoti in 2008. The realization of the unpredictability of a central factor of the Neolithic and the deviations from the one expected model, model are, to my mind, enough to undermine any generalized explanatory argument, aiming at simplifying and rationalize a predominantly complicated process. The case of Pagliambella in comparison to the broader Aegean context is just one of those cases where variability observed compels us to think that there is no such thing as a singular Neolithic. Neolithic is a delicate and mainly unpredictable adaptation in a diverse mixture of natural, social, economic, and political spheres, and it happens at the small, not the macro scale. It cannot be transported from a place because it does not exist as a physical thing or as a set of mental templates. It cannot be reduced to movement of genes because genes are not the culturally defining element and they don't take decisions. For this reason, rather than theorizing from incomplete and even lacking evidence, it is imperative to turn back to the field and study the maximum possible, in the maximum possible detail the adaptations of the earliest communities within the cultural, social, and natural pool of possibilities of the wider context. The Pagliambella Colindros excavation presents an excellent opportunity to do that to a much greater extent, extent than it was possible 20 or 30 years ago. Thank you for your attention.